Thank you, Mina. Um, I hope you all have been learning some um, valuable information from the morning sessions. Uh, before we get to the this afternoon's presentation, I want to announce a couple housekeeping items. The first announcement is that the emojis, chat, and Q&A functions have been enabled so y'all can interact with the presenters. Um, please put all your inquiries in the Q&A function down below so our presenters can track the questions and respond. Megan uh, Maddock will be the first presenter, and therefore she'll be answering your questions in the Q&A while MJ and Chris are presenting. And then while Chris and MJ are presenting, they will alternate in responding to your questions. Uh, we have a hard time stop at 2.20 p.m. However, if we have a few minutes at the end, um, Megan, MJ, and Chris can answer some questions live. My second announcement is that if you need captioning, go ahead and click on the ellipsis down below with the word more and click captioning. And then thank you to my CSAC colleague, Mina Tran, who's online with us for helping us with technical logistics. And then lastly, JBay and YLC's presentations will be emailed out to y'all as a PDF following the summit. All right, let's get started. Uh, I want to introduce myself as your moderator for this session. My name is Kimberly Newman Lias. My pronouns are she, they, and Sha in Tagalog, and identify as a first generation college student. Financial aid and college access partners have uplifted me while I navigated college and completed my graduate training. As a result, it has been my lifelong commitment to help close the achievement gap for historically disenfranchised populations. I serve as a Cash for College coordinator for the California Student Aid Commission, where it's our mission to promote educational equity by making post-secondary education affordable for all Californians. I want to share some quick statistics with y'all. And so far, there are 3,000 668 CHAFE recipients in the 24-25 cycle, and with the Foster Youth Access Award, there have been 6,168 awards granted. Therefore, I want to highlight the important work of our colleagues at John Burton Advocates for Youth, JBay, and Youth Law Center, YLC. We have students statewide that need our help to access these awards and seek support so they too may pursue their post-secondary educational goals. This year's summit theme is Leading Student-Centered Financial Aid, California's Best Practices and Partnerships. I have the pleasure of introducing today's presenters, Megan Maddock from JBay, MJ Hart, and Chris Middleton from YLC. The presentation is Post-Secondary Access and Success for Systems-Involved Youth. Thanks for the emojis. Uh, I'll start off with introducing Megan Maddock. Uh, Megan Maddock is a project manager with the education team at John Burton Advocates for Youth, where she supports efforts to improve post-secondary outcomes for youth in foster care and youth experiencing homelessness. Megan has spent the last 10 years in the field of child welfare, starting off as a social worker at the Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services, DCFS, before moving on to lead programming for foster youth, at court-appointed special advocates, CASA programs in Los Angeles and Marin County. She earned her BS in psychology at the University of California, San Diego, and her master's in social welfare, MSW, with an emphasis in child welfare and organizations, communities, and policy settings from UCLA. Next, I'll introduce MJ Hart. MJ Hart is the Pathways to Higher Education Project Coordinator at the Youth Law Center, where they play a pivotal role in developing and implementing programming and supporting statewide policy that facilitates access to higher education for juvenile justice-involved youth. Born and raised in North Fair Oaks, California, MJ's life was shaped by systemic challenges that led to extensive systems involvement in both the juvenile and foster care systems. Breaking free from these confines, MJ harnessed the power of education for personal liberation and communal upliftment. Becoming the first in their family to earn a high school diploma, an AA from, in psychology from Foothill College, and a BA in psychology with a minor in history and co of consciousness from UC Santa Cruz. Currently, they are pursuing a master's in equity and social justice education at San Francisco State University. MJ's Deep understanding of the challenges faced by scholars from similar background, backgrounds fuels their dedication to creating 
educational pathway that not only provides access, but also empower juvenile justice involved youth to reclaim their narratives, awaken their critical consciousness, and boldly step into a future they shape. Beyond academia, MJ's work extends into youth organizing, community outreach, re-entry navigation, and artistic expression, leveraging their art to advocate for empathy and social change. MJ's life and work stand as a vivid reminder that from adversity can spring hope, leadership, and transformative change. Last but not least is Chris Middleton. Chris Middleton is an Equal Justice Fellow, or sorry, Equal Justice Works Fellow sponsored by Baker McKenzie and Salesforce Incorporated based in Oakland, California. Chris's fellowship project focuses on reducing homelessness among child welfare and juvenile justice involved youth in California, New Mexico, and Washington through coalition building, community education, representation in administrative hearings, systemic advocacy, and litigation. Previously at the Youth Law Center, Chris completed a Stanford Law School Dean F. Johnson Public Interest Fellowship. His prior work focused on addressing the challenges of the school to prison pipeline in California, ensuring access to quality education for child welfare and juvenile justice involved youth, limiting the use of congregate care settings in child welfare and uh, juvenile justice, especially the disproportionate impact of institutional settings on LGBTQ plus youth and addressing conditions and issues in the juvenile justice system. Prior to joining YLC, Chris served as a law clerk to Judge Myron H. Thompson and Judge W. Keith Watkins in the United States District Court for the Middle District of Alabama. If you can please show some emoji love to our presenters, continue on doing that. I'm going to turn it over to Megan Maddock to kick off the presentation. Thank you so much, Kim, and thank you to my co-presenters and for everyone on the call today. It's exciting. It's exciting to be here. Um, thank you all for for showing some love as well for this population. Excited to excited to share with you. So I'm going to be talking th this afternoon about post secondary access and success for youth with experience in foster care. And before we dive into that and I talk about what we're going to talk about today, I wanted to share a little bit about what JBay does. So John Burton Advocates for Youth, we are a research and policy advocacy organization. We also, you know, following that research and policy advocacy, dive deep into technical assistance. So many of you may have been working with us already. We run a statewide FAFSA CADA challenge for foster youth and students experiencing homelessness. So we may have crossed paths at one point, um, but excited to be here to talk about um, to talk about the young people that we we impact. I have a lot of things to talk to you about, so I feel like I'm going to be jamming through this this presentation, but the good thing is I love getting emails and talking to folks afterwards, so I will put my email in the chat at the end and we can connect if you all want to talk further. But I'm going to give you some context for the child welfare system in California. Who are the young people? Who are the families that we're, we're working with? What comes up for these uh, these young people as they're trying to access post-secondary education, how we can support them. And then of course, I have to plug some helpful JBay resources for you all to take away with um, when you leave today's webinar. So starting off with just some, some context, um, you know, we have an, as of this year, just, just shy of 55,000 children under court ordered supervision in the in the child welfare system in California. That number is huge. It's also been declining since 2020. So we've been seeing more emphasis on you know, supports around preventing children and families from become from becoming systems involved. So while that number seems huge, it's been an improvement, um, a, a reduction for the last few years, although there's still plenty of plenty of work to be done. And when we talk about kind of how children are coming into this system, you know, oftentimes the, the majority of times what a, a concerned citizen or a mandated reporter like a teacher or a doctor or police officer is making a call to a child protection hotline. And that child protection hotline, which is connected to the county Child Protective Services is going out, making an investigation, determining if that young person, that child is safe or not. 
And there are many reasons why a child might come in contact with, with CPS, might need a, a report filed on their behalf. And I think, you know, one of the important things to, to understand is that a majority of these young people are coming in for what we call general neglect. So I think when we're, we, you know, if we don't have a lot of contact with child welfare system, if we don't have a um, knowledge or, or understanding of what of what it looks like, I think what we often think of is physical abuse, of sexual abuse, but the vast majority of children are coming in for, for general neglect. And how we define that is a child is at, you know, um, risk of suffering and of harm due to failure or an inability of a parent or guardian, guardian to provide adequate supervision, protection, or care. So it's kind of punitive language there, but it could mean things like uh, a parent is struggling with substance use or mental health, or there's domestic violence in the, in the family. And I should note, you know, that poverty and child neglect or what we define as child neglect are correlated. You know, families who are experiencing poverty are focused on survival and basic needs are also under an incredible amount of stress. So we do see a connection or a correlation between rates of poverty and child neglect. I want to make it clear that poverty does not create neglect or, or poverty does not cause neglect, but there is a big overlap um, in those two conditions because of the systemic barriers, the systemic hardships that families are under when they're experiencing poverty. Um, we're, I think there's efforts underway to, to change this and redefine neglect so it excludes you know, conditions of poverty. It's very complicated and I think we'll see that you know when we look um, even even closer at the at who we're serving in the child welfare population. So I wanted to highlight this the slide on on disproportionality because I think it speaks to the the complex systemic issues that are part of the child welfare system. And we see a very clear disproportionality when we're looking at race and ethnicity within within child welfare. So a couple columns here on the screen. I want to highlight that the second column is the percentage of uh, children that are of that race or ethnicity within the entire California population. And then that last column is the percentage by race and ethnicity of children within the child welfare population. So I think we can see across our um, populations in California that there is disproportionality. So some populations are over or underrepresented in child welfare compared to their general um, population in California. And I'm going to highlight a few that I think um, are, are impactful, which is our Black African American children. You can see that in the general California pop population, about 5% of our children are Black African American, but they're represented at, at close to 21% in our child welfare population. On the other hand, where we see that underrepresentation, um, we can look at our Asian and Pacific Islander population where they make up around 11% of our uh, general child population in California and almost 2% or 2% in our child welfare population. So I think, you know, in these last two slides, I really wanted you all to take away that um, the child welfare system is not immune to the complex systems that we have and racism influences of poverty and that that carries through the system as well. You know, just to add to the disproportionality discussion, we do see disparities across race and ethnicity as well, in particular for our Black and African American children. We see lower rates of adoption, longer time in foster care, and um, that's something we have to be aware of and continue to work to improve um, as, we, as we have this discussion. 
I also wanted to talk, I mean, there's there's many different kind of placements that a child can have within the foster care system. And I, I wanted to highlight two that I think are important for us to think about. So about 25% of our children in California are in what we call family reunification. So in this process, a child has been removed from the care of their parent or parents and placed in an out of home setting, such as they could be with a relative, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle. They could be with a, a non-relative, like a foster parent, or they could be in a congregate care facility, what we, we used to call group homes or residential facilities. We also have about 15% um, of children who are still at home with their parents. So in this case, a social worker from the county has determined that it's safe for the child to remain at home with their parent or parents, but they do need court intervention to help address whatever the challenge is that is going on at home. So I wanted to, um, I wanted to put that out there because we're thinking about, you know, different types of supports, accessing higher education today, and where children are living makes a, makes a difference. And for you all who are working with students, you know, we also want to highlight many students in, in many children in child welfare are school aged. I think um, there's a growing number of children who are entering at that zero to five years old. Makes sense. These are our, our little ones. They're particularly vulnerable. So that number um, is growing. But we also see quite a large percentage across the school spectrum. And so if you're working with students, if you're in K through 12, if you're working with students the, at the college level, you may and will have young people who have experienced or are experiencing the foster care system. And you'll notice that, you know, about 20% of those students are in the 18 or children are in the 18 to 21 year old age, uh, age range. And this is a unique uh, segment of our population that we refer to as extended foster care. So th in California and most other states, we allow young adults who turn 18 to remain in the child welfare system voluntarily until they, they turn 21. And this law was passed um, because we recognize that you're still very young at 18. Uh, the child welfare system used to cut off at 18 and young people would be trying to navigate life on their own. And that's very difficult when you're, um, when you're just becoming an adult, and especially if you don't have a lot of adult support as you're, as you're exiting care. So in this, um, in this setting, young adults can stay voluntarily until 21, receive support from a social worker, and be eligible for other programming like support with uh, finding housing and life skills. As long as they are working, attending school, that includes high school and college, or be involved in a job training program um, that is working towards uh, being employed. Another thing to, to highlight with extended foster care is that you know, youth who are between the age of 18 and, and 20 or so can re-enter and uh, can exit care and re-enter. So a student who's 19, for example, may feel like I'm done with the child welfare system. I don't want to be part of it. Leave the system and then six months later decide they want to come back into care. And I always like to highlight that for folks who are working directly with students because it is, it can be a valuable resource if you have students in that age range um, to be able to reconnect them back to those supportive services that they're receiving. These are often also for our folks who are working with college age youth, um, young people that you might be directly, directly interacting with. So now that we have a sense of kind of who our young people are, what things, what things are looking like in California, I do want to spend some time talking about kind of the unique circumstances of, of young people experiencing foster care and what are some of those barriers to accessing post-secondary education and, and education in, in general. So I, I, I put this slide up here because I think 
mo many of us know that young people who have experienced foster care have that difficulty accessing post-secondary ed and have challenges of navigating and being successful in education. Of course, it is not universally the case, um, but I think it's important um, and we'll see kind of what are the systemic issues? What are the barriers to young people accessing accessing education? I want to highlight, you know, since we're we're talking a lot about we're talking about post secondary ed, that you know, recent recent research research shows that only ten percent of foster youth you know, have received receive a AA or bachelor's degree by the age of twenty three. So that's a big difference compared to our general population. I also want to acknowledge, you know, as we're looking at this data, that young people in, in foster care, as you all know, are like any other child. They have hopes, they have dreams, they have ambitions, but they do also have si significant barriers, many of them that are due to no fault of their own, many of them that are due to their systems involvement that are preventing them from having some of those same opportunities as other young people. So let's dive into some of what those barriers might might look like. Um, a big thing is school changes and disruptions. So if if you all are working with young people in foster care and young people experiencing homelessness, you know that changing schools, changing placements is one of the biggest challenges for youth in foster care. It leads young people to be falling behind in course studies, in those A through G courses, if they're in high school. It, um, it disrupts the forming of relationships with friends, with teachers, with counselors. Each school change can sometimes lead to delays in enrollment or, um, you know, challenges in transferring records or credits. And all of these can kind of add up um, for a young person and be a barrier when they're you know ready to access post secondary education. I think you know you can see that that statistic up on the screen that you know at even one change for a school can mean losing four to six months of learning with each of those placement changes, with each of those school changes. It's something that we saw on a large scale with the pandemic, where young people were out of school, were had kind of were transient maybe in their in their school engagement and we saw the loss of learning there. So um, we see that with young people in care because they are often changing placements because they're often having those those disruptions. It's also, um, you know, the nature of young people in care, especially young people in care who are in that family reunification setting. They've been removed from their family unit. They're being placed maybe with a with a foster parent or in a residential facility where they're losing those connections to key people in their life. For many of us, when we think about kind of who supported us getting getting through school, getting into post-secondary education, a lot of us will will say, you know, it was it was a parent, it was someone, it was a relative, it was someone close to us. And young people in foster care don't always tend to have a, a number of those relationships to rely on. So all of those things that, you know, your adult supporter helped you do to enroll in college, like fill out applications, apply for financial aid, those aren't always accessible and young people are often navigating that on their own. So when we looked, um, again, this was recent research, about half of young people and have reported that in the college planning process, they didn't have enough support with all of those things that they needed to do to access post-secondary education. And I want to highlight some even newer research from, from last year. This was by, uh, the, by Trellis that notes that 70% of youth who were formerly in foster care, so this is former foster youth, 70% um, were not aware that their college or university provided specific programs for foster youth. So it's definitely, you know, when we're re relying on young people and students to self-navigate post-secondary ed, um, there can be gaps in young people accessing that material and having the information that they need to, to thrive. Of course, when we're talking about 
you know, young people who have experienced, you know, a form of, of abuse or neglect, we're talking about traumatic experiences that that young person has, has um, kind of experienced. We are also, you know, have the experience of trauma that comes from just being systems involved. So we talked about those multiple placement changes, those lack of connections with peers, those disconnections from family. All of those things are layered on to a young person's experience. And that can create challenges with their mental health, with their behavior, with their self-esteem. And these impacts of trauma can show up in school settings, not just in post-secondary ed, but in K through 12 as well. And I have a slide a little bit later, we can talk about kind of how that, how that looks like and how that might manifest for, for some students. Related to that, you know, because young people have this, they're carrying this complex trauma, or they're also carrying a lot of, um, you know, disruption in their life with changing schools, changing placements. We know that young people in, in care are more likely to be diagnosed with a learning disability and more likely to receive special education services at school. We also know that this isn't necessarily a barrier for attending and succeeding in post-secondary ed, um, but it is important to acknowledge, to note, and that young people in care may need connections to the right services and support so they can succeed once they get to, once they get to campus. And once a student you know, gets to college, there are still, there's still barriers. One of the, or I should say the top concern we hear from young people with experience in foster care about going on to post-secondary ed is that they don't feel like they can afford it. Um, since youth in care often do not have family support, they are shouldering most of those living expenses on their own. So when we're thinking about cost of attendance and we're thinking about you know, expenses that a student may need to um, may need to pay for. When we were in college or if you were in college, you may have had a trusted adult that you could ask for support. You know, you someone would pay your phone bill or you may have helped been helped getting groceries once a month or you had you could go home to your family for the weekend to do your laundry or to um, you know, have have dinner and some of those experiences are not necessarily available to our young people with experience in foster care. We also know that because of, you know, the concern around finances and you can see that many of our of our young people in foster care face financial difficulties already, partially why we, we, we just talked about they're shouldering a lot, you know, on their on their own. Many of our young people with um, with experience and care are juggling work in addition to school responsibilities. And we know that, you know, if the more a student has to work, that can impact their academics and their their path to graduation. So many of our young people are balancing this um, this need for this incredible and, and rightful need for to be able to provide for themselves and their academic ambitions. Related to that, I, I wanted to specifically call out housing because that is a particular challenge for our for our young people, in, in particular in a state that is as expensive with housing as California. So, you know, young people in care are particularly vulnerable to becoming unhoused. And you know, this is um, research from, from Cal Youth that a third of, of young people report at least some instance of experiencing homelessness between the ages of 17 and 21. And as, as you all know, folks who work with students, students who are, again, rightfully focused on surviving, on achieving your, their basic needs, on, on feeding themselves and housing themselves, that is going to pull them away from their studies. They're going to lose um, they're going to be spending that brain energy trying to survive and not always on their academic progress. So I think, you know, stable housing, supportive housing is really key for our young people in care. And um, just to, to share statistics again from that trellis study, 
69% of former foster youth have, have reported that they have housing insecurity and 45% of former foster youth have very low, very, very low food security. So these are big things on top of academics that our young people are trying to navigate. I mentioned earlier that, you know, trauma impacts um, learning and that may show up in different different ways for our, our young people. And again, you know, we're, we're talking about young people who are holding a lot within within their bodies, within their minds. And many of our young people are, are you know, worried about their next placement, worried about where they're going to be, be living, where they're going to be, um, you know, who they're interacting with. And all of that um, can lead to, you know, the inability to concentrate, you know, lack of trusting relationships or difficulty forming trusting relationships with adults, um, difficulty concentrating. I could imagine if you're thinking about all of these, if you're holding all of this information, that it's um, challenging to concentrate. I'm going to skip through that, um, uh, but I'll, I'll mention it that, you know, as we're talking about these barriers, these are also things that young people can internalize. And when, as adults, when we're interacting with young people who have experienced trauma, who have experienced foster care, sometimes our personal biases or opinions about what a young person can do and how they can succeed in post-secondary education can rub off on young people. And we see that a lot with our foster care uh, students where, you know, they're, they're not encouraged necessarily to pursue post-secondary education because they've gone through a traumatic experience or because they're, um, you know, having a mental health challenge. And we want to, um, we hope, I hope in this next section that I'll be able to kind of share a little bit more about how we can address those barriers and also address those biases that come up when we're working with young people. And and one thing that I really, you know, I think this particular statistic, and I'll, I'll pull it up in a minute, is is powerful because we we talked about kind of those, the barriers and the challenges and the impact on educa on um, for education that young people in foster care experience, and we we noted earlier that ten percent of foster youth achieve a, a AA or bachelor's degree by the age of 23. That is a huge gap between the number of young people who actually say who say they want to go to college. So young people in foster care, almost all of them say that they want to go to college. And I think, you know, when we're looking at that disconnect between that 93 and 10%, some of that comes up in those barriers. And there's many things that we can do to address, address that. And one of the easiest things that we can do um, is just talk to youth about post-secondary ed. We know that when young people in foster care were encouraged to go to post-secondary, to pursue post-secondary education, they were more likely to do so. So having conversations with young people about college, about career goals can, can jumpstart that process and it's something that everyone who's working with a young person is able to do. We talked about financial aid being a major barrier or financial need being a major barrier for foster youth. And financial aid makes a huge difference um, for our young people. So shout out to CSAC and the work that you're doing there to connect more young people in foster care to financial aid. Because what we know is that students, any student who completes the FAFSA are more likely to enroll in higher education. And we see that particularly with foster youth and the Chafee Grant, who are uh, more than two times likely to complete a degree if they've received that, um, that financial support. We also know that the, the more money a student receives, the more likely they are to transfer or graduate. So you can see there those numbers at the bottom. For students who received more than $7,500 in financial aid, they were almost 50%, 50 percent of them um, transferred or graduated compared to students who received kind of less, less money. So we want to make sure that our students are connected to that aid. And again, there's great supports for students in California 
And what we know is that many of our of our young people in foster care just don't know that this is available to them. So if you're working with students who are accessing financial aid, you know, um, to access financial aid, these conversations about what's out there, helping them complete the FAFSA and CADA so they can see what they might get is a huge, um, a huge like motivator for them to to go on to to school. And in terms of supporting um, youth with accessing financial aid, you know, for many of our, our foster youth, they will qualify as an independent student. And as someone who, who does a lot of FAFSA CADA trainings for folks, it's not always an easy form or an easy process for a student to understand to head up and how to fill out that part of the FAFSA. So, um, really encourage you if you're working directly with young people to help them walk through that process through individual support with their financial aid applications. Young people um, do do much better when they have that hands on uh, hands on support and they're able to kind of walk through the questions and and answer them as they as they would need to 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 qualify for that additional aid. Another uh, another benefit or more benefits that we want to share is that, you know, there are supports available through our public um, university systems in California that support young people in accessing post-secondary ed. And again, these are things that our students may not be aware of and that we can help help them understand um, so that they they feel like there's um, there's support for them on campus. You know, there's application fee waivers at the CSUs and UCs, as well as priority housing, which means they get first dibs on those. Um, I think I, I forgot I had some fun animation in this slide. So there is priority housing at CSUs and UCs. And if we recall, you know, students uh, have uh, foster youth students have an incredible need for housing and st housing stability and having first dibs at housing and being able to stay in the dorms um, on campus housing can help provide that stable living environment for many of our young people. You know, we also have priority registration at our public universities and, and colleges, which helps students get the, the classes that they need in um, before the general population and helps young people kind of get those core courses that they need. And then we also um, have for our community college tuition waiver, which is a, an incredibly valuable resource for so many of our students and for our foster youth students in particular, that um, for students in foster care, they are able to maintain this tuition waiver regardless of their academic performance once in college. So this can help students remain in their post-secondary education coursework as um, you know thinking back to those barriers and those challenges young people are navigating if academics aren't the first priority at the moment and their grades are slipping they can still maintain their their tuition waiver their enrollment in college and um, continue kind of to develop their develop the supports that they need to to get back to where they were. Of course, I also want to highlight our incredible foster youth campus based support programs. Um, we have next up programs at every community college in California that support young people who are in foster care on or after their 13th birthday. We also have many other foster youth support programs, including at community colleges, um, but mostly at the CSUs and UCs, where students can participate if they've been in foster care at any time. And these supportive programs provide so much to young people. They provide grants, they provide tutoring, community building events, workshops, mentoring, and it really is a excellent space, an excellent community and resource for students in, in care uh, or formerly in care on campuses. And in addition to the many other campus services that students um, can be connected to. I think one of the one of the biggest things that we recommend is if students are on campus, 
get them connected to their foster youth campus support program, get them connected to all these other resources that are available to them so that they know, um, again, when they're experiencing those challenges that may come with their systems involvement, that they have people to reach out to, that they have a supportive community um, to be able to, to address those needs. And I, again, a, a, a big thing that I want to share for our young people is that uh, we want to do warm handoffs. So again, remembering that our young people in care may not have those adult relationships, may not have a parent or adult supporter who's helping them navigate all of those many resources, many departments, and that as someone who works with students, you can help make those direct connections so young people know where to go and who to talk to. I'm going to finish up um, with some resources and I'm going to go through this quickly because I got to pass it off to my to my colleagues, but um, we have a number of resources at JBay to help um, to help plan. We have an education planning guide that walks adult supporters through all the steps to enroll in college, financial aid, college planning, um, including career and technical uh, education programs. So check that out. Um, and an accompanying guide just about financial aid. So if um, you want more, uh, you want more answers to those questions about how we can support youth in getting connected to financial aid, this is where you should go. And lastly, we have a big webinar coming up this month where we're going through the FAFSA step by step for youth uh, with experience in foster care or experience in homelessness. And it's a great tool, great webinar for adult supporters um, just to learn about what that process looks like. So I'll drop all these links in the chat and as well as my email, but I do want to pass it over to Chris and MJ um, for, for their incredible presentation that they have, they have for you. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So we'll be covering young people who are impacted by the juvenile justice system. And for the sake of time, I'm going to be going rather quickly. If you have questions, please feel free to follow up via email. We'll be happy to chat more. Um, so as was mentioned at the intro, I'm joined by my wonderful colleague, MJ Hart, who is the project coordinator for the Pathways to Higher Education um, work here at Youth Law Center, and I'm Chris Middleton. I'm a staff attorney and Equal, Just Work, Equal Justice Works Fellow here at Youth Law Center. Uh, it wouldn't be a training with a lawyer without having a disclaimer that this is for educational and informational purposes only and should not be construed as legal advice. And so the Youth Law Center is an organization that provides legal training, legal technical assistance, and advocacy support and we do that on all manner of issues that impact young people, be they involved with the juvenile justice system, the foster care system. Um, I've been doing through my fellowship increased work around immigration and also young people who are experiencing homelessness, as well as access to benefits and a number of issues that impact young people. Um, so MJ has really been taking the lead on our higher education, um, Pathways to Higher Education work that is really focused on unifying stakeholders across California to create a robust program for young people who are in the juvenile justice system and been engaged with both state and federal advocacy to improve access to financial aid for juvenile justice impacted youth. And then also using higher education as a step down and support as a true community-based alternative to incarceration for young people. So investing in their education and viewing that as a path through rehabilitation, regardless of utilizing incarceration or the juvenile justice system. So with the time we have left, we are going to give you a very brief overview of the California juvenile justice system and the young people who are impacted by it. And MJ is gonna spend most of our time um, talking about the available supports that young people have. And we're gonna leave you with some easy digestible takeaways that you can bring to all of your friends and colleagues. So most people think of the juvenile justice system as a pipeline where the juvenile hall is the end point. And you can think of these different stops along the way as the equivalent of arrest, trial, sentencing, and then ultimately a placement is made as well as there being a diversion pathway. 
And the reason why we say that young people are impacted by the juvenile justice system is that we know that young people are often moving between a variety of different school settings as well as placements. So in this, I, I swear, this is a simplified version of the many different placements that a young person might have when they're impacted by the juvenile justice system. So that blue circle there represents the juvenile court school or the juvenile um, detention facility. That might be a juvenile hall. It might be a uh, secure youth treatment facility where the school that they attend is often operated by the County Office of Education is a juvenile court school. Uh, I'll put a link in the chat to our report on juvenile court schools in California if you're interested in learning more about them. In addition to being placed in a juvenile hall or SYTF, young people also might be moving between foster care and their home. And with those moves as well, it means that young people sometimes are juggling between being in the alternative education system, being in traditional public schools, as well as moving between court schools, which creates a lot of educational instability. And so there are a lot of barriers that young people um, who are in the impacted by the juvenile justice system face. We know that there is an overrepresentation of youth with disabilities, youth who are in, um, in the foster care system, youth who are experiencing homelessness, youth of color, low income youth, and pregnant and parenting youth. So all those challenges that uh, Megan was discussing with that are apply to foster youth, many of them apply to young people who are impacted by the juvenile justice system as well. In addition, there are some specific barriers that exist for young people who are impacted by the juvenile justice system. Um, like I mentioned before, there's a lack of educational stability because you're moving between many different placements. And when you're in a court school or other settings, you may not always have access to the appropriate services that you need. Having an IEP not be respected is unfortunately a difficult challenge that many students um, engage in. And having access to the necessary um, kind of guidance and pathways and opportunities put before you around higher ed may not be a priority at every court school or at every facility. Another common challenge is that when young people are transitioning out of the court school and they're trying to reintegrate in their community, that's a point where many young people become disengaged with school and don't successfully return to that community school. And we also know that sometimes young people face real barriers and discrimination because of their juvenile justice status of being accepted to their prior school once they're, when it's the time for them to return. Despite those many challenges, we know that the majority of young people who are impacted by the juvenile justice system aspire to go to college and beyond. And that many of those youth expect to hold a steady job in the future. Based off of what the young people themselves, and despite the circumstances that they're placed in, they have this enduring faith and belief of pursuing higher education and a better life for themselves and the family that they want to have or support. So part of our mission is figuring out how do we not only increase that percentage, but how do we make sure that those young people who are motivated are genuinely given access to those opportunities. And that's part of the work that we've been doing in California and part of the work I hope that you'll join us in. And so California has made this historic $15 million um, investment in the education of young people who are impacted by the juvenile justice system. Now, MJ is gonna get into the details of what some of these programs look like, but as an overview, know that these programs are meant to support young people with this background who are focusing on starting their college journey. It creates an opportunity where we're not only focused on bringing young people to education, we're bringing education to young people by bringing opportunities to access community college while a young person is in detention and then continue once they are no longer in detention, creating that opportunity where we're actually bringing the education to that young person. And so I'll let MJ get into the details, but I've just wanted to highlight that young people are interested and going to college, young people are going to college, and now more than ever, California is investing in making that more likely. So I'll let MJ take it away. Thank you, Chris. I commend you and always doing a, a very good job of centering our human lived experiences because we're going to college. 
juvenile justice involved youth are going to college. We've been wanting to, and now California, we're all moving in this shift and we are collectively and intentionally investing in our youth in ways that they need to be invested in, loved and cared for. And what is college, right? And I, um, I will kind of address this as well as someone who had asked the question earlier. It was a really great question to the differences between uh, what is college, right? So college, uh, post-secondary education, it can be a four-year university degree where you go straight from high school to a four-year. You can, um, it could be where you're preparing at a, for a two-year degree at a community college. And this is where they can either earn a two-year degree, an AA or AS, and then they would, or they can prepare to transfer and transfer to a four-year university where they will then um, complete their BA or BS. Um, and then also the difference is community colleges, they also provide vocational technical skills training. So like uh, vet tech, um, HVAC, different things like technical training like that as well. But they also expand on broader curriculum that would be, you would define it as education, as going through a um, traditional educational path. But it's not limited to only community colleges. There are, like I said, the example, there's like Job Corps, there's like union trades. So there is secondary education access for uh, JJ youth and uh, youth involved in the foster care system. Um, and there's also certificate programs, right? The programs that are preparing you for the job uh, placement or the job field. But it's the unique thing about college and a secondary education is that, or post-secondary education is that the students themselves who JJ impacted, a lot of us probably, we don't have examples of co what college education is or access to what it can be. So the beauty of it is community colleges offer us access to explore what we like to, what we wanna learn or explore uh, different elements of our backgrounds or different things that we can actually envision ourselves having a future. Oh, oh if you wanna, sorry. Thanks, Chris. Can you switch it to the next one? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay. I kind of pretty much said this already. So in California, briefly, career technical schools, right, is um, often available at community colleges. And that's what we're talking about, like the uh, apprenticeship programs, different technical job training skills programs, certificate programs, but then also broader curriculum where if they want to do psychology, biology, different aspects. But coursework can include a variety of things, vet tech, automotive, uh, different unions as well. Go ahead, Chris. I'm also being brief. Sorry. Um, yes. So the beauty about actually having this uh, information for y'all, a lot of misconceptions is that JJ youth or uh, youth involved in the juvenile justice system, they aren't eligible for financial aid, but they are eligible for financial aid. And a lot of policies that have been changing recently and accessing Pell Grants is a unique opportunity that we must spread this information and encourage our youth to access these uh, resources by being the ones that are facilitating it and bringing the information to them. And like Chris said, we are bringing this to the youth. So this is the main biggest uh, element is, uh, Megan also touched on it, right? Is not having the funding, right? So you um, briefly, JJ, having a JJ history, prior history, it does not impact el eligibility for federal financial aid. There's no bar to access federal financial aid um, based on prior conviction convictions or adjudications um, for drug offenses. Yeah. Uh, and then youth and juvenile justice facilities can access Pell Grants without any restrictions unless they have an adult criminal conviction. And youth detained in juvenile justice facilities who are who have a criminal conviction can still access Pell if they are enrolled in an approved prison education program. And this is where we, this changes, right? Where we're bringing education to the youth inside of the, the detention facilities, with juvenile hall or different facilities where they are being housed. And they can actually access like the Pell Grant and different resources, but they have to be enrolled in actually earning college course credits, which is the beauty about um, bringing this college to the youth. Go ahead, Chris. And I just wanted to add the, the real impact of like hearing a no here. For many of our students, like Megan mentioned, the financial need and barriers that exist for education can be seem like impossible to overcome. And so getting accurate information about when aid is available is really important. And so I've definitely worked with young people who have been told no, who thought that college was inaccessible for them. And that wasn't true. And we were able to like have them put on the right path and are pursuing college now. But I just wanna highlight the power of that no. So I would just invite people that if you're not sure, if you're not certain, if you're working with a JJ youth and you don't know if there's a restriction, ask first. It's okay to say, you know what? I'm not sure, let's figure it out together. And if you need an additional contact, my email is there. You will not annoy me. You will not bother me. I consider it part 
of our job and responsibility to help ensure that this information is being made. So just want to make that plug and I'll turn it back over to MJ. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chris. Yeah, I'm trying to be as brief as possible, but this that is one of the crucial aspects in myself as being directly impacted as well like that. You have to access financial resources. And because we are talking about uh, youth who are dual systems impacted as well, there is um, resources and financial means that they can be eligible for both. And definitely asking questions. Thank you, Chris, for saying that, because the best thing we can do is is support the youth with care and model what it is to navigate these uh, no's, right? Um, so beauty in building our network and community the in California, how we've been building our infrastructure. First and foremost, as I, I know many of y'all haven't, if you do know, you haven't, I'll just briefly touch on it. The California Rising Scholars Network is a support program for uh, justice involved scholars in community college. But the unique thing about the Rising Scholars Network being institutionalized across uh, California community colleges is they are focused now on a juvenile justice involved program that the majority of the Rising Scholars programs that were in existence before did not um, include or expand for uh, access for resources for juvenile justice. So the unique thing about this is the Rising Scholars now are having a program um, alongside the adult focus program where uh, the students are getting support and juvenile justice. And in this, um, the Rising Scholars are also doing um, college course curriculum and uh, instruction inside the detention facility. So they're able to earn college credit. They're able to actually earn, like do dual enrollment, have access to different resources, wraparound services. Um, yes, go ahead, Chris. Hello. I know we have only had a couple more minutes left, so I'm sorry, I'm gonna be brief. Thank you, Chris. Um, and the Rising Scholars is specifically for community colleges. Now in the university system, the Underground Scholars Network that was founded in 2013, it's a support program for students within the UC system in California. Um, they have now expanded to every single UC. So there is one at every single UC and they support in the transfer process in um, really advocacy, uh, retention and recruitment. So they're supporting the students who are directly involved and advocating for policies and programs to be uh, reflective and change within to be uh, supportive for their lived experiences. Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> Sorry, Chris, can you see me? I thank you. Um, now in the CSU uh, system, there is the Project Rebound. So California's Project Rebound. This was actually um, founded by John Irwin way back in 1967. He was uh, formerly incarcerated, directly impacted, and he noticed that there was the need for support for students who were formerly incarcerated within the higher education system. And the beauty so beautiful about uh, Project Rebound is they also, um, in 2018, they opened the Irwin House, which this provides, like Megan had touched on it, right? That housing stability. So the Irwin House is really this um, life affirming space where they're not only providing stability with housing, but also holistic wraparound support. They're able to build community, heal, and really formulate a future that they're co-creating and seeing themselves within. and bringing each other up and really building that community. And this is within the UC, I mean, the CSU system. And right now it's only at 15 um, campuses, but I'm sure it's gonna continue to expand. Thank you, Chris, you can go to the next one. All right, so YLC, the beauty and so, th I'm so thankful and honored to be um, this past year, the uh, project coordinator for the Pathways Higher Education Project. And the beauty of it is we, uh, our student leadership cohort, amazing student leaders, the, um, as all of this policy and legislation has uh, been passed and the $15 million has now been allocated, the main thing with YLC is when all of all of these fundings and opportunities are happening, we're really also focused as well as we want to ensure that the voices of the students who are being directly impacted, their lived experiences are being centered and actually amplified in programs and policies and development and impacting these spaces that are representative and actually realistic to their lived experiences. And that really comes with those who are directly impacted and the student leaders themselves all, were, this was a statewide cohort from the various uh, rising scholars and across California. And our program this past year was really focused on leadership development, uh, policy advocacy, power building skills, not only formulating themselves in uh, their skills to leverage their lived experiences, to advocate for programs and policies that actually are reflective of their lived experiences, but also they, it's a space where they cultivated a space to be safe, to be vulnerable, to explore their identities and really choose who they want to be in the world. So it's not even just them uh, building their, their skills to leverage their own expertise to impact programs and policies, but investing in them as young people, as leaders, as community members, and helping them reclaim their lives and build a future. And um, much more to come on that as well. Go ahead, Chris. 
If you want to say something, Chris, too. I know I'm being real. I was I just know. saying I love seeing that photo and I am I get to watch MJ and the beautiful community that you've directed and created around our students. And just it's been so amazing to see how they've blossomed and transformed as part of your support and your leadership and all the cool things that they've gotten to be a part of. And you're going to share one of them right now. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Chris. I appreciate you. And and it's definitely an honor and a responsibility. Like you said, I take it real serious, like leadership. We are not just a representative represent representative of ourselves but of our community and modeling it, it it matters it it matters and it's so impactful and into that we're going to talk about one of the big projects that we did this last year was um in partnership with the stanford law policy lab the reimagine gateway court school project our student leaders came to the space uh i think three different focus groups where they provided their expertise and their insights on what were the continuation schools and the court schools that they attended, what were the things that did not work for them? And what were the supports that were needed? And it ranged from anything from, uh, you know, social emotional uh, development to mentorship to all the different resources that the students wanted and needed to, su to succeed. But now, even though they didn't have it in their pathway, they are trailblazers and leading the way for justice involved youth now for the future. And in that, so excited, as um, this was actually like an initiative with the uh, San Mateo County Office of Education to reimagine what the court school would look like. And in that, it's now a real centered, um, we're reimagining it to be on a college campus, to be in a physical space away from juvenile hall, to be having actual wraparound support services, to have men personalized mentorship, um, and really just investing in their education to be, be a high quality access to education and seeing them in their development and healing because a lot of our community, um, we not only are learning that, but we really need that. And yeah, so this was one of the most impactful um, projects that we did this last year that we're going to continue to build on. And if I had more time, I would uh, expand on it. But we, you can also email me. No problem. Well, I can communicate with y'all and provide any support services that you possibly would need access to. Okay, so I know we went very quickly, but we wanted to make sure we left a little bit of time for questions. So just some key takeaways. Our young people have a lot of overlap with the populations you are already serving, and they're eligible for many of the resources that are available to foster youth students, and they have many of the same needs. Um, we also know that youth who are impacted by the juvenile justice system, um, they can and they do go to college. It's happening right now. That's exciting, good news that we should feel great about. Um, and, and that young people are eligible for and receiving federal and state financial aid. And again, if you have questions about that, always happy to answer them. And that California has this really wonderful opportunity to support young people who are impact, who are juvenile justice impact um, with the state's historic investment ensuring college access. And you all who are on this call, who are here with us today, are part of whether or not we're gonna be able to maximize the effectiveness of our investment. I have been so amazed by how the young people that we've worked with, especially with, as part of the student leadership cohort, have improved the quality of the work that I produce as an attorney, how they're improving the communities that they're a part of. When we are given young people the opportunity to truly become leaders, to truly feel like their community cares about what they say, that they have something that is valuable, that we all can learn from, that they're just as worthy to contribute. That is like what I believe education can help you understand about yourself, even when the circumstances that you are born into doesn't present you with those opportunities. That's what I truly believe is the fullest potential and power of education. It's been so meaningful to spend these minutes talking about our wonderful, wonderful students and happy to continue that conversation. I, um, I left our emails in the slides. And so when those are sent out, you'll have them. But we're happy to now transition to take questions from everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, so much. And, and I just want to also just uh, briefly touch on uh, that we all have a unique opportunity to really invest in actual care and these avenues of restoration and growth and really move away from that ways of being rooted in punishment and shame and different things that just don't feel right. And just, I commend you all being here and please reach out to us as resources. We want to support this and continue to support our young people as best as we can. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.
All right, so I believe that folks can put their questions in the Q&A function and we'll happy to answer them. And yeah, we've been doing our best to answer questions live as they've been coming in. And sorry, Megan, if I answer questions that were for you, I was doing my best to just <laughs> respond That's as great. they were coming. But um, yeah, it's been really wonderful to hear from folks and happy to keep the conversation going. I could also elaborate too. I know you're at dual enrollment. Like the opportunity for the youth inside the hall is that now they're getting college courses taught by college professors inside the hall, and it's dual enrollment. Y'all probably heard of like middle college where they went to community college and they're like juniors and seniors. So it is now they are access the youth inside detention are accessing um, college courses and they're able to earn both high school credit and college course credit and able to actually uh, have a pathway to secondary education. Hey, Heather, so good to see your question in there. I'm definitely going to send you some resources, Heather. I will also say as a resource for um, youth who are involved in the child welfare system, if y'all ever heard of, uh, if they're in Santa Clara County or San Mateo County, there's Pivotal Scholars, and that is a lovely scholarship resource, and it has no age limit, which is rare. just want to... Shout out my my colleagues on the call there. There's some love for us in the Q and A, so I thought I would. <laughs> thank you all. It's very lovely. Yeah, um, I'm gonna put in the chat a link to the report I very briefly mentioned um, that we put out last year that concerns um, students in the juvenile court schools, and we examined two school years, and so th the report is here. Uh, the page that I'm linking it to has a summary. The report is long. I know this has been quite the week for folks. So no shame in just skimming uh, the, the kind of summary that's there on that page. And if folks want to talk about that more or want to learn more about court students or students who are impacted by the um, juvenile justice system in general, please feel free to reach out. Like MJ said, this is a really, really exciting time for our students and that there are going to be more cohort students who are doing work around the Bay Area. So if you're in the Bay Area and you're like, wow, these young people in our photos not only look amazing, but are doing really amazing work and you wanna be a part of it, please contact MJ. Um, and I'm sure that there will be many opportunities that we can take advantage of. Yes, thank you. Please do reach out. You have my email and I'm trying to share if I can in the chat um, the flyer. If I oh, yes, I can. I'm going to put a outreach flyer in the chat. So please feel free to. Oh, wait. Yes, to everyone. Um, if they uh, a community college in the San Francisco Bay Area, that's where we're focused this next year is local and really continue to build on the projects that we have going on. Um, please share out to your network, to youth that you think uh, will be interested and eligible. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me and also my contacts on the flyer as well. And please do, we wanna support and get this out to as many youth uh, that we can and just communities and really continue to do this work and build it out and right on y'all, appreciate y'all. Hi folks, I think there's a question. Um... I honor Sally if our students in JJ system eligible as independent on FAFSA. I can answer. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. You can go ahead. <laughs> um, not necessarily unless they are also have foster youth status as well. So if they are involved in both the juvenile justice system and the foster care system, so if they after the age of 13, they would qualify as an independent student. Um, just juvenile justice system involvement does not qualify a student as, as independent. 
status. And this is something that continues to cause a lot of confusion because of the ward of the court language that FAFSA uh, used, yes. which is a term of <laughs> art that means something different and they really shouldn't have used it. Um, but what Megan said is correct. So, and again, if that's something that you have a question on, I know that they made it easier where if you're a young person and you have some unusual circumstances that aren't just like formal foster care, that you can also be an independent student that way. And there's like no shame in that. I know when mm -hmm. I filled out FAFSA for law school, um, I won't get too personal, but I had some complicated situations with family and uh -huh. it was really hard for me to figure out and navigate that. So I appreciate the changes that were made. So it's a more of a formal process that financial aid um, offices are prepared for. With me, it was more of like, hey, this is my situation. And it feels like I'm the first person you've ever met who didn't have this like bright and happy, shiny, perfect family. And that wasn't a great experience. Um, and I, I'm glad that FAFSA is doing more to change that. And then MJ, if you could put a link, there was a request for the Pitbull yes. Scholars. No worries, Perfect. I just put it in the in the chat. And I will uh, briefly say, if they were adjudicated a ward of the court and like they have their paperwork as well, they can work also with um, accessing resources because there is ways, the language that, yeah, like I said, in FAFSA, it's like very like, like needs to be more clarified, but definitely working with the student and, and the comfort level, definitely there is resources just having to like ask questions like Chris is saying, yeah. All right, everyone, we're at time. Uh, thank you, Megan, MJ, and Chris for sharing your expertise. We at the Student Aid Commission appreciate your work and your continued collaboration. I'm sure our audience members are walking away with at least one new piece of information, hopefully connect with your organizations. Thank you everyone for carving time out of your day to attend this session. You're welcome to head on out for a quick break and attend your breakout two session. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks y'all, take care.